we are on air. Ah. Last time, oh, I want to say it's last time. Greetings, well, 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 start a little bit. Greetings. This is Amuna. And the last time um, I finished the um, drawing of Blank Island Love, again, for those who just joined us, uh, I said I would read another book. And so I'm still doing my research, but like I say, I kind of, kind of touch and go, touch and go, touch and go. So I have a little time today, y'all. Yeah, so um, share this if you can. We're going to be reading, I said I would read this one or another one. I picked this one, Coming of Age in Mississippi. It is so-called Black History Month, okay? And um, I say so-called because for those who know and those who don't, I really don't subscribe to the term Black as a uh, a designation of melanated people. That's why you usually hear me say melanated people. So I'm almost certain that I've read this before a while ago and I don't remember all of what is in it. So I'll let you know when I come upon something that I, I possibly have transposed. Coming of Age in Mississippi by Anne Moody. I referred to this book when I was talking about some of the uh, remnants of our experience in enslavement in the Western Hemisphere, one of those things being um, the leaving of children to be reared by other children because of certain economic um, situations that people and parents may find themselves in. And I referred to it when I was doing um, that portion of the Unraveling R. Kelly study. I'm still doing more. It's not done. Just, just learning. Oh my goodness. I don't even want to go into it. Let me get into this. Coming of age in Mississippi. I'm still haunted by dreams of the time we lived on Mr. Carter's plantation. Again, this is the fifties. So it's not like, you know, 18, 1700s. This is, this is mid 1900s. I'm still haunted by the dreams of the time we lived on Mr. Carter's plantation. Lots of Negroes lived on his place like mama and daddy. And they were all farmers. We lived in a rotten wood, two long shack but ours stood out from the others because it was on up on the hill with Mr. Carter's big white house overlooking the farms and other shacks below. It looked just like the Carter's barn with a chimney and a porch, but mom and daddy did what they could to make it livable. Since we had only one big room and a kitchen, we all slept in the same room. It was like three rooms in one. Mama slept in one corner and I had my little bed in another corner next to one of the big wooden windows. Around the fireplace, a rocking chair and a couple of straight chairs formed a sitting room area. This brick room had a plain, dull colored wallpaper tacked loosely to the walls with large thumbtacks. Under each tack was a piece of cardboard which had been taken from shoe boxes and cut into little squares to hold the paper and keep the tacks from tearing through. Because there were not enough tacks, the paper bulged in places. The kitchen didn't have any wallpaper and only furniture in it was a wood stove old table and a safe. Mom and daddy had two girls. I was almost four and Adeline was crying baby about six or seven months. We had rarely saw mom and daddy because they were in the field. Every day except Sunday, they would get up every early in the morning, sorry, early in the morning and leave the house just before daylight. It was six o'clock in the evening when they returned just before dark. George Lee, mama's eight year old brother kept us during the day. He loved to roam the woods and taking care of us prevented him from enjoying his favorite pastime. He had to be at the house before my mother, sorry. He had to be at the house before mama and dad left for the field. So he was still groggy when he got there. As soon as mama then left the house, he would sit up in a rocking chair and fall asleep. Because of the solid wooden door and windows, it was dark in the house, even though it was nearly daybreak. After sleeping for a couple of hours, George Lee would jump up suddenly as if he was awakened from a nightmare, run to the front door and sling it open. If the sun was shining and start sling, oh sorry, sling it open. If the sun was shining and it was a beautiful day, he would get all excited and start slinging open all the big wooden windows, making them rock on their hinges. Whether he started banging the windows and looking out the woods longingly, whenever he started banging the wood, the windows and looking out the woods longingly, I got scared. Once he took us to the woods and left us sitting in the grass while he chased birds. That night, mama discovered we were full of ticks, so he was forbidden to take us there anymore. 
Now, every time he got the itch to be in the woods, he beat me. Kind of bright, jacking my eyes up. One day he said, I'm going hunting. I could tell he meant to go by himself. I was scared he was going to leave us alone, but I didn't say anything. I never said anything to him when he was in that mood. You heard me, he said, shaking me. I still didn't say anything. Whack! He hit me hard across the head. I started to boo-hoo as usual, and Adeline began to cry too. Shut up, he said, running over to the bed and slapping a bottle of sweetening water in her mouth. You stay here, right here, he said, forcing me into a chair at the foot of the bed. And watch her, pointing to Adeline in the bed. And you better not move. Then he left the house. How old was she again? She was four. A few minutes later, he came running back into the house like he forgot something. He ran over to Adeline in the bed and snatched a bottle of sweetening water from her mouth. He knew I was so afraid of him, I might have sat in the chair and watched Adeline choke to death on the bottle. Again, he beat me up. Then he carried us on the porch. I was still crying, so he slapped me, knocking me clean off the porch. As I fell, I hit my head on the side of the steps and blood came gushing out. He got some scared. He got so some scared and cleaned away all tracks of the blood. He even tried to push down the big knot that had popped up on my forehead. That evening we sat on the porch waiting as we did every evening for mom of them to come up the hill. The electric lights were coming on in Mr. Carter's big house as all the Negro shacks down in the bottom began to fade with the darkness. Once it was completely dark, the lights in Mr. Carter's house looked even brighter, like a big lighted castle. It seemed like the only house on the whole plantation. Most evenings after the Negroes had come from the fields, washed and eaten, they would sit on their porches, look up towards Mr. Carter's house and talk. Sometimes as we sat on our porch, mama told me stories about what was going on in that big white house. She would point out all the brightly lit rooms saying that old lady Carter was baking tea cakes in the kitchen. Mrs. Carter was reading in the living room. The children were studying upstairs and Mr. Carter was sitting up counting all the money he had made off the Negroes. I was sitting there thinking about old lady Carter's tea cakes when I heard mama's voice, Essie, Essie May, Essie May. Suddenly I remembered the knot on my head and I jumped off the porch and ran towards her. She was now running up the hill with her hoe in one hand and straw hat in the other. Unlike the other farm hands who came up the hill dragging their hoes behind them, puffing and a blowing, mama usually ran all the way up the hill laughing and singing. When I got within a few feet of her, I started crying and pointing to the big swollen wound on my forehead. She reached out for me. I could see she was feeling too good to beat George Lee, so I ran right past her and headed for daddy, who was puffing up the hill with the rest of the field hands. I was still crying when he reached down and swept me up against his broad, sweaty chest. He didn't say anything about the wound, but I could tell he was angry, so I cried even harder. He waved goodnight to the others as they crossed across the hill towards their shacks. As we approached the porch, Daddy spotted George Lee heading down the hill for home. Come here, boy, Daddy shouted, but George Lee kept walking. Hey, boy, didn't you hear me call you? If you don't get that up that hill, I'll beat the daylights out of you. Trembling, George Lee slowly made his way back up the hill. What happened to Essie Mae here? What happened, Daddy demanded. Uh, uh, she fell off the porch and hit her head on the step, George Lee mumbled. Where... Where were you when she fell? Um, uh, was putting a diaper on Adeline. If anything else happened to one of these chaps, I'm gonna try my best to kill you. Okay. Get yourself home for I. The next morning, George Lee didn't show up. Mama and daddy waited for him a long time. I wondered where in the blink, H-E double hockey sticks, could the D-A-M and boy be? Daddy said once or twice, pacing the floor. It was well past daylight when they decided to go on the field and leave Adeline and me at the home alone. I'm going to leave y'all here by yourself. Whoa, so wait a minute. I'm sorry. So the four-year-old is being left in charge because the eight-year-old couldn't show up. That's so much to say. I'm going to just keep reading. I'm going to leave you here for you by yourself. Essie May said, Mama, if Adeline wake up crying, give her the bottle. I'll come back and see about you and see if George Lee's here. 
She left some beans on the table and told me to eat them when I was hungry. As soon as she and daddy slammed the door, I was hungry. I went to the kitchen and got the beans. Then I climbed in the rocking chair and began to eat them. I was some scared. Mama had never left us at home alone before. I hope George, I hope George Lee would come even though I knew he would beat me. All of a sudden, George Lee walked in the front door. He stood there for a while grinning and looking at me without saying a word. I could tell what he had on his mind and the beans began to shake in my hands. Put them beans in that kitchen, he said, slapping me hard on my face. I'm hungry, I cried with a mouthful of beans. He slapped me against the head again and took the beans and carried them into the kitchen. When he came back, he had the kitchen matches in his hand. I'm gonna burn you two crying for, you know what? I forgot this book was kind of, I'm gonna burn you two crying fools up. Then I won't have to come here and keep your, your blink every day. As I looked at, at that stupid George Lee standing in the kitchen door with the funny grin on his face, I thought that he might really burn us up. He walked over to the wall near the fireplace and began setting fire to the bulging wall, wall, wallpaper. Sorry. I started crying. I was so scared. I was peeing all down, peeing all down my legs. George Lee laughed at me for peeing and put the fire out with his bare hands before it burned very much. Then he carried me and Adeline on the porch and left us there. He went out in the yard to crack nuts and play. We were on the porch only a short time when I heard a lot of hollering coming towards the field. The hollering and crying got louder and louder. I could hear mama's voice over all the rest. It seemed like all the people in the field were running to our house. I ran to the edge of the porch to watch them top the hill. Daddy was leading the run, running crowd and mama was right behind him. Lord have mercy, my children is in the house. Mama said, was screaming, hurry diddly. She cried to daddy. I turned around and saw big clouds of smoke booming out the front door and shooting out the cracks everywhere. Their SMA is on the porch, Mama said. Hurry, diddly, get Adeline out that house. I looked back at Adeline. I could hardly see her from for the smoke. George Lee was standing in the yard like he didn't know what to do. As Mama them got closer, he ran into the house. My first thought was that he would be burnt up. I hoped he would get killed. Oh, wow, just, just, wow, okay. I don't even like being in this house. But she hoped that he got murked. But I guess I didn't really want him to die after all. I ran inside after him, but he came running out again, knocking me down as he passed and leaving me lying face down in the burning room. I jumped up quickly and scrambled out after him. He had a water bucket in his hand. I thought he was going to try to put out the fire. Instead, he placed the bucket on the edge of the porch and picked up Adeline in his, hand, in his arms. Moments later, Daddy was on the porch. He ran straight into the burning house with three other men right behind him. They opened the large wooden windows to let some of the smoke out and began ripping the paper from the walls before the wood caught on fire. Mama and two other women raked, in, raked into it into the fireplace with sticks, brooms, handles, any, anything else available. Everyone was coughing because of all the smoke. Soon it was over. Nothing had been lost but the paper on the wall. Although some of the wood had burned slightly in places, now that daddy and mama had put out the fire, they came onto the porch. George Lee still had Adeline in his hands and I was standing with them on the steps. Take Essie made them out in the yard, George Lee snapped daddy. George Lee hurried out in the yard with Adeline on his hip, dragging me by the arm. Daddy and the farmers who came to help sat on the edge of the porch, taking in the fresh air and coughing. After they had talked for a while, the men and women wanted to clean up the house but mom and daddy refused any more help from them and they soon left. We were playing rather pretend, we were playing rather pretending to play because I knew what was next and so did George Lee. Before I could finish thinking it, daddy called George Lee to the porch. Come here boy, he said. What happened? Yeah, it's angry. George Lee stood there before, before him trembling. I went to well to get a bucket of water and then when I had come back, I see the house on fire. It's me must have did it. George Lee is wicked, by the way, but anyway. Not only, okay, I'm gonna try not to comment to the end, y'all. As he stood there lying, he pointed to the bucket he had placed on the edge of the porch. That seemed proof enough for daddy. He glanced at me for a few seconds. That seemed like hours. I stood there crying. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, but daddy didn't believe me. He snatched me from the porch into the house. Instead, inside he looked for something to whip me with. George Lee is, George Lee is. But all the clothes, had been taken off the nails of the wall and were piled up on the bed. I would have taken hours for him to, it would have taken hours for him to find a belt. So he didn't even try. He felt his waist to discover he was wearing overall, overalls. 
Nothing was in his reach. He was getting angrier by the second. He looked over at the wood stack near the fireplace. Oh my God, I thought he's gonna kill me. He searched through the wood for a small piece. There was one to be found. Moving backward, he stumbled over a chair. As it hit the floor, a board fell out. He picked it up and I began to cry. So he gonna, what is he gonna do to the uh, four-year-old? He threw me across his lap, pulled down my drawers and beat me on my naked behind. The licks came hard one after the other. For those who have just joined us, we are reading Coming of Age in Mississippi. I said I would read it after I read um, Island Love. For those who've been here for some time, you remember back in 2016, we did the left project. It was heavy, so I had to put it down for a minute. Um, and so I think this time around, I kind of miss reading sometimes. So um, if I schedule a time to read, then I will resume some of my readings. But we're going to switch it up. We're not going to do all heavy content. But this is Coming of Age in Mississippi by Ann Moody. Screaming, kicking, and yelling, all I could think of was George Lee. I will kill him myself after this, I thought. Daddy must have beaten me a good 10 minutes before Mama realized he had lost his sense and then came to rescue me. I was burning like it was on fire back there when he finally let go of me. I tried to sit down once. It was impossible. It was hurting so bad, even standing up was painful. An hour or so later, it was so naughty and swollen, I looked as if I had been stung by a hive of bees. This was the first time Daddy beat me on a lie, too. George Lee is wicked. <laughs> but I didn't speak to him or let him come near me as long as my behind was sore and hurting. Mama told me that he didn't mean to beat me and that hard and that he wasn't angry at me for setting the fire. When I kept crying and telling her that George Lee started the fire, she told daddy that she thought George Lee did it. He didn't say anything. Yeah, because I don't beat that already. I'm sorry. But the next morning when George Lee came, he sent him back home. Mama stayed with us the rest of the week. Then the following week, mama's 12 year old brother, Ed came to keep us. So they just keep. One moment, please. Had to check on the babies. Thank you for your patience. All right. All right, all right, all right. Okay, where am I? Now, Ed, come. Let me send where the eighth year old I'm bringing back the, 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 the 12 year old. And it's a boy. Anyway, I, I'm going to. Um, a week or so after the fire, every little thing began to get on daddy's nerves. Now he was always yelling at me and snapping at mama. The crop wasn't coming along as he had expected. Every evening, ah, close the door. Every evening when he came from the field, he was terribly depressed. He was running around the house grumbling all the time. Blink. So it's a <laughs> Sugar, honey, iced tea. Blink. It was just a waste of time. Didn't get enough rain for nothing. We ain't gonna even get two bales of cotton this year. This corn ain't no good, and them sweet potatoes just burned up in the hard, blink grass. He starts cursing all over the place. GD, I, I, I did a better on job than this. Ain't gonna have nothing left when Mr. Carter take out his shit because they're sharecropping, right? We had to hear his this sermon almost every night. And he was always snapping at mama like it was all her fault. During the harvest, daddy's best friend, Bush, was killed. Bush was driving his wagon when his horses went wild, turned the wagon over in the big ditch alongside the road. It landed on his neck and broke, and daddy, and sorry, and broke it. His death made daddy even sadder. The only thing, the only times I saw him happy and, and more were then, sorry, the only times I saw him happy anymore were when he was on the floor rolling dice. He used to practice shooting them at home before every big game, and I would sit and watch him. He would even play with me 
then. And every time he would win, every time he won that money, he would bring me lots of candy or some kind of present. He was good with a pair of dice and used to win the money all the time. He and most of the other men gambled every Saturday night through Sunday morning. One weekend he came home without a cent. He told mama that he had lost every penny. He came home broke a few more times. Then one Sunday morning before he got home, one of the women on the farm came by the house to tell mama he was spending his weekends with flunks. Bush's beautiful widow. I remember he and mama had a real knockdown, drag out session when he finally did come home. Mama's fist fight, sorry, mama fist fought him like a man, but this didn't stop him from going over to Florence's place. He even got bolder about it and soon went out, went as if he liked, well, sorry, even got bolder about it and soon went as often as he liked. No. Florence was a mulatto, high yellow with straight black hair. She was the envy of all women on the plantation. After Bush's death, they got very particular about where their men were going and they watched Florence like a bunch of hawks. She couldn't even go outside, sorry, she couldn't even go outdoors without some woman peeping at her and reporting that she was now coming out of the house. Mama had never considered Florence or any of the other women a threat because she was so beautiful herself. She was slim and tall, tawny skin, tawny skin, with high cheekbones and long dark hair. She was by and far the liveliest woman on the plantation and daddy used to be delighting her. When she played with me, she was just like a child herself. Daddy used to call her an overgrown child and tease her that she had too much Indian blood in her. Meantime, mama had begun to get very fat. Her belly kept getting bigger and bigger. Soon she acted as if she was fat and ugly. Every weekend when she thought daddy was with Florence, she didn't do a thing but cry. Then one of those red hot summer days, she sent me and Adeline to one neighbor nearest to us. We were there all day. I didn't like the people, so I was glad when we finally went home. When we returned, I discovered why mama had gotten so fat. She called me to the bed and said, look, what, why, why mama, why? She called me to the bed and said, look what Santa sent you. Santa sent her a belly? I, I was upset. Santa never brought live dolls before. It was a little bald headed boy. He was some small and looked as soft as one of our little pigs when it was born. His name is Junior, mama said. He was named after your daddy. My daddy's name was Fred, so I didn't understand why she said the baby was named Junior. Adeline was a year old and walking good. She cried like crazy at the sight of the little boy, baby. While I stood by the bed looking at mama, I realized her belly had gone down. I was glad of it. I had often wondered if daddy was always gone because her belly had gotten so big. But that wasn't it, because after it went down, he was gone just as much as before, even more. Next thing I knew, we were being thrown into a wagon with all our things. I really didn't know what was going on, but I knew something was wrong because mom and daddy barely spoke to each other. And whenever they did exchange words, they snapped and cursed. Later in the night, when we arrived at my great aunt Cindy's place, all our things were taken from the wagon and daddy left. Where's daddy going? I cried mama. By his business, she answered. Aunt Cindy and all the children stood around the porch looking at him drive the wagon away. That dog, that no good dog, I heard mama mumble. I knew then he was gone for good. Ain't he gonna stay with us, I asked. Nah, he ain't gonna stay with us. Shut up, she yelled at me with her eyes full of water. She cried all that night. Y'all know how hard I'm holding myself back. <laughs> I'm holding myself back and it's not funny. From a, from a, from a, a trauma observation healing perspective, Jeez, now I know I have to take a break from reading these books. We were allowed to stay with Aunt Cindy until Mama found a job. Aunt Cindy had six children of her own, all in a four room house. The house was so crowded, the four of us had to share a bed together. Adam and I slept at the foot of the bed and Mama and the baby at the head. Aunt Cindy had a mean husband and our presence made him even meaner. He was always grumbling about being there. I ain't got no food. I ain't got enough food for my own children. 
he was always saying. Mama would cry at night after he had said such things. Mama soon got a job and worked up the road from Aunt Cindy at the cook's house. Mrs. Cook didn't pay Mama much money at all, but she would give her dinner leftovers to bring home for us at night. Hold on one second, y'all. Hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. So Mama got a job. Mama got a brand new baby, a job, and a four or five-year-old. And where are the babies? We'll be back. Hold on a second. All right, so um, mama got a job, mama got three children, and the priority is they got to eat. So she was making $12. Oh, wait, wait, wait. This was all we had to eat. Mama worked for the cooks for only two weeks. Then she got a better job at a Negro cafe in town. She was making $12 a week, more than she had ever earned. About a week after she got the new job, she got a place for us from the cooks. Mrs. Cook let mama have the house for $4 a month on the condition that mama would continue to help her around the house on her day off from the cafe. The cooks lived right on a long rock road that ran parallel to Highway 24, the major highway for Negroes and whites living between Woodville and Centerville, the nearest towns. To get to our house from the road, you entered a big wooden gate. A little dope road ran from the gate through the cook's cattle pasture and continued past our house to a big cornfield. The cooks planted the corn for their cattle, but often when mama didn't have enough money for food, she would sneak out at night and take enough to last us a week. Once Mrs. Cook came out there and put up a scarecrow, she said the crows were eating all the corn. When mama came home from the cafe that evening and saw the scarecrow, she laughed like crazy. Then she started taking even more corn. She had a special way of stealing the corn that made it look just like the crows had taken it. She would knock down a few ears and leave the hanging on the stalks. Then she'd drop a few between the rows and pick up a few others. I don't ever remember any anything she did, but before that season was over, Mrs. Cooks had three more scarecrows standing. Right, be, right below the cornfield at the base of the hill was a swampy area with lots of trees. The trees were so thick that even during the day, the swamp was dark and mysterious looking. It looked like an entirely different world to us, but mama never let us go near it because she said it was full of big snakes and people hunted down there and we might get killed. Our little house had two rooms and a porch. The front room next to the porch was larger than the little box in the kitchen you could barely turn around in. Its furniture consisted of two small beds. Adeline and I slept in one and Mama and Junior in the other. There was also a bench to sit on and a small tin heater. Our few clothes hung on a nail on the wall. In the kitchen, there was a wood stove with lots of wood stacked behind it and a table. The only chair we had was a large rocking chair that was kept on the porch because there was no room in the house for it. We didn't have a toilet. Mama would carry us on out in back of the house even to each night before we went to bed to empty us. Shortly after we moved in, I turned five years old and Mama started me at Mount Pleasant School. Now I had to walk four miles each day up and down that long rock road. Mount Pleasant was a big white stone church, the biggest Baptist church in the area. The school was a little one room, rotten wood building. She said it was rotten, I can't. Located right next to it. There was about 15 of us who went there. We sat on big wooden benches, just like the ones in the church, pulled us up closer to the heater, but we were cold all day. That little rotten building had big cracks in it and the heater was too small. Reverend Kaysen, the minister of the church taught us in school. He was a tall, a tall yellow man with horn rimmed glasses that sat on the edge of his big nose. He had the largest feet I had ever seen. He was so big, he towered over us in the little classroom like a giant. In church, he preached loud and in school, he talked loud. He was sitting in the class with his sounds ringing in our ears. I thought of putting cotton in my ears, but a boy had tried that and the Reverend caught him and beat him three times that day with one big switch he kept behind his desk. I remember once he caught a boy lifting up a girl's dress with his foot. He called him up to his desk and whipped him in his hands with a big switch until the boy cried and peed all over himself. He never did whip me. I was so scared of him, I never did anything. I hardly ever opened my mouth. 
I don't even remember a word he said in class. I was too scared to listen. She, she said she don't <laughs> I care with her. I was too scared to listen to him. Instead, I sat there all day and looked out the window at the graveyard and counted the tombstones. One day, he caught me. Moody gal, if you don't stop looking out the window, I'll make you go out in that graveyard and sit on the biggest tombstone out there all day. Nobody laughed because they were all as, they were all as scared of him as I was. We used the toilet in the back of the church. The boys' toilet was on one side and the girls on the other. The day after Reverend Carson yelled at me, I asked to be excused. While in the toilet, I thought to myself, I can stay out here all day and he wouldn't even know I'm out here. I began to spend three and four hours a day in the toilet and he didn't even miss me until a lot of other kids caught on and started doing the same thing. About three weeks or so later, about five of us girls were in the toilet at the same time. He had been out there almost, an, we had been out there almost an hour. We were standing behind the partition in front of the toilet, giggling and making fun of Reverend Cason when all of a sudden we heard him right outside. If y'all don't come out of that toilet right this second, I'm gonna come in there and drown you. Why, why is it? It's just violence. We peeped from behind the partition and saw Reverend Cason standing there with his big switch in his hand. Didn't I say come out of there? If I had to come in there and get you, I'm going to beat your brains out. Reverend Cason, I ain't finished yet, I said in a trembling voice. You ain't finished yet. You've been in here over three hours. If y'all don't get out of there, then he was silent. I peeped out again. He was coming towards the door. I ran out and headed for the classroom, followed by the rest of the girls. When we got around in front of the church, we met up with a bunch of boys running down, sorry, running from the to boys' toilet. We all scrambled in the door. There were only two students sitting in the class. Everybody gone outside. <laughs> I sat in my seat and didn't even breathe until I heard Reverend Carson's big feet hit the bottom step. He came through the door puffing and I'm a uh, huffing, puffing and a shouting. But he was so tired from yelling and chasing us, he didn't even beat us. After that, he wouldn't excuse us until recess. And then he would have to round us up and bring us back to class. Every morning before mama left for the cafe, she would take us across the road to grandfather Moody. I would leave for school from there and he would keep Adam and Junior until I came home. My grandfather lived with one of my aunts. He was very old and he was sick all the time. I don't even remember seeing him out of his bed. So how he gonna look after the children? But aunt then would leave for the field at daybreak so whenever we were there, my grandfather was alone. He really cared a lot for us and he liked mama very much too because mama was real good to him. Sometimes my aunt then would go off and wouldn't even fix food for him. Mama would always look to see if there was any food left for him in the kitchen. If there wasn't, she would fix some patty, some batty cakes or something for him and he would eat them with syrup. Often when mama didn't have enough money for food, he gave her some. I think he felt guilty for what his son, my daddy had done to us. He kept his money in a little sack tied around his waist. I think that was his life savings because he never took it off. Some mornings when mama would bring us over, he would look real depressed. Too sweet, what's wrong with you? Grandpa, grandfather would ask in a weak voice. You need a little money or something? Do Diddley ever send you any money to help you with these children? It's a shame the way that boy run around gambling and spending all his money on women. Uncle, Uncle Moody, I ain't heard nothing from him and I don't want to. The Lord will help me take care of my children. I sure wish he'd do right by these chaps, grandfather would mumble to himself. Soon after school was over for a year, grandfather got a little sicker than he was before. Mama stopped carrying us by his place. She left us home alone. And he would bake a and she would bake a pone of bread to last us the whole day. One evening she came in from work looking real sad. Essie May, put your shoes on. I want you to come. I want you to come go say goodbye to Uncle Moody. He's real sick. Adeline, I'm going to leave you with Junior and Junior by Miss Cook. I'm going to come right back. And y'all better mind Miss Cook, you hear? Mama, why I got why I got to say goodbye to Uncle Moody? Where he going, I asked. He going somewhere. He going to be treated much better than he's treated now. And he won't ever be sick again, she answered sadly. I didn't understand why Mama was so sad if Uncle Moody wasn't going to be sick anymore. I wanted to ask her, but I didn't. All the way to see Mr. Uncle Moody, sorry, not Mr. Uncle Moody, Uncle Moody. I kept wondering where he was going. 
It was almost dark when we walked up in my aunt's yard. A whole bunch of people were standing around on the porch and in the yard. Some of them looked even sadder than mama. I had never seen that many people there before and everything seemed so strange to me. I looked around at the faces to see if I knew anyone. Suddenly I recognized daddy, what top? No, daddy come. Squatting in the yard in front of the house, he had a knife in his hand. As mama and I walked towards him, he began to pick up, pick in the dirt. He glanced up at mama and he had a, that funny, funny look in his eyes. I had seen it before. He looked like he wanted us back so bad, but mama was mean. She had vowed that he would never see him again. She would never see him again. As they stood there staring at each other, I was reminded of the first time I saw him after he left us when, when we lived with great aunt Cindy. It was Easter Sunday morning. Mama and aunt Cindy and all the children were sitting on the porch. We were all having a beautiful time. It was just after the Easter egg hunt and we were eating the eggs we had found in the grass. Okay. Mama was playing with us. She had found more eggs than all of us and she was teasing and throwing eggshells at us. As I was dodging eggshells and giggling at mama, I saw daddy coming down the road. I jumped off the porch and ran to meet him followed by the rest of the children. He gave me lots of candy in a big bag and told me to share it with the others. As we walked back to the porch, I could see mama changing expression. Daddy was grinning broadly. He had something for mama in a big bag he carried with care in his arms. I don't remember what they said to each other after that, but I remember what was in the big bag for mama. It was a hat, a big, beautiful hat made of flowers of all colors. When she saw the hat, mama got real mad. She took the hat and picked every flower from <laughs> your mama is guest. <laughs> she took the hat and picked every flower from it, petal by petal. She threw them out in the yard and watched the wind blow them away. Daddy looked at her as if he hated her, but there was more than hate in, her, in, all, in it all. This was just how he looked at out in the yard now as he sat picking in the dirt. Hold on. I was very frightened. I thought at first he would kill mama with a knife. Mama stared at him for a while, then went straight past him in the room, in the house, leaving me in the yard with him. Come here, Essie May, he said sadly. I walked to him, shaking. They say you in school now. Do you need anything, he asked. I was so afraid I couldn't answer him. He felt in his pocket. Out of it, he came a roll of money. He gave it to me, smiling. I took it and was about to smile back when I saw Mama. She came out the house and snatched the money from me and threw it at her. Then Daddy got up. The time... This time, I was sure he would hit Mama, but he didn't. He only walked away with that hurt look in his eyes. Mama grabbed me by the end and headed out off the yard, pulling me behind him. Ain't gonna say goodbye to Uncle Moody, I whine. Ain't I'm gonna say goodbye to Uncle Moody, I whine. Ain't that why she came over there? He told me to tell you goodbye, she snapped. And, and she he's sleeping now, so I mean he passed. That night, we had beans for supper as usual. And all night, I wonder why Mama threw back the money Daddy gave me. I was mad with her because we ate beans all the time. Had she, had she taken the money, I thought we could have meat too. But also just joining us, we're reading Coming of Age in Mississippi, Ann Moody. This is the autobiography. It's a true story of Ann Moody. Uh, she was civil rights. She was uh, active in the civil rights sit-ins and during the civil rights era. Um, so stay tuned. I think I'm going to come back in a little later. I have to do some mommy type stuff, but I'm not going to take long, long, long because I got a little bit of time this week. There's so much I have to say, a little bit of a recap. Maybe you want to go back and watch the beginning and then we're going to come back and read another chapter in a few. But, you know, just from a, a perspective of what is happening economically, this is during sharecropping. So there's some people who are still living on plantations in the 50s and 60s sharecropping. And in particular in Mississippi, she's saying that they still live on the plantation and that they were putting children in charge of watching children, um, which presented a problem um, from the eight-year-old boy. And in, in light of looking at molestation and access that children had to other children, uh, we see what are the conditions that would surround such some, something, the way you would leave a four-year-old to watch a baby because you had no other choice, because you had to go to work, or else they wouldn't even have beans to eat. You understand what I'm saying? So it's so... If you missed it, go back and listen, because I'm going to come back. I see the numbers are going up. So how, how about we do this? What time is it now? All right, I should come back at around 
to read chapter two because the chapters are in, they're not that that long, but they're decent long. So I'll give you some time to ch catch up and then I'm going to come back and read chapter two. Read along with me. I'll see you soon. What did I say? 730? 730. All right, 730, y'all. All righty.